in one phrase. I said, I think I'm a pragmatic rebel, which means inside I've always countered culture. Inside I don't go with anything. I, I don't watch American Idol and and, and, I, and I don't listen to uh, KISS FM. Whatever things that I don't, I'm not a Republican, I, 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 but I'm pragmatic, is that I'm not that reckless. You know, I, I'm not an activist because it takes too much trouble and too much energy. So, but I'm, but I still always consider myself a rebel because I come out of the, I come out of the era of rock and roll. You know? I come out of the '60s and the '70s. So, but I, I, but I go up to the line. See, this is what the almost, this is what the subtitle of my book is, and why it's so in keeping with me, is. How an almost famous rock journalist found himself, lost everything, and found himself almost. That last almost is really important because I'll creep right up to the to the to the precipice of enlightenment as I creep up to the precipice of rebellion, as I creep up to the precipice of freedom, as I creep up to the precipice of bondage. It's just I just never kind of like woo dive off the cliff. Well, I I noticed on the cover of your book you have a picture of um. Satan or some soul in purgatory. But that's not, that was not my design. When, they, when I was in New York and they showed me the cover of design, the first thing I did was, my publisher Amy Hertz goes, we're so excited about this. And I looked at it, I go, that's David Lee Roth cover. She goes, what? You don't know how hard we worked on this. The guy in the, in the art department who designed this is a big Rip Magazine fan. I said, well, that's a little ain't enough. That's the devil. He goes, and then so she brings the guy in who designed it. He goes, what an honor to meet you. And I go, I go, dude, that's the... He goes, I know. It's a public domain image of the devil. Many people have used it. But combined with the graphics of this and the fact that you don't know whether he's screaming in pain or laughing with glee, I think it really works for what your book's all about. And I went, okay, dude, I'm fine with it. And that was it. And I've gotten great praise from the, about this cover. Because I noticed on the back, it's blown up, but the head's cut off. Yeah. Well, that's you being quirky. Quirky. I don't think it means anything. Doesn't I think mean it's anything. a graphic decision. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. what, uh, what advice would you give uh, the people who want to get into the business, the entertainment business, reporting? Well, first of all, I wouldn't give anybody advice to get into the business. I would give people advice to follow their muse, to express themselves, to utilize their talents and their crafts, to, to communicate with kindred, like-minded people. And then if they end up in the entertainment business, then great. Because I think of, um, I think of Bon Jovi, who um, in the book, you talk about how John says they could be the next ACDC, but instead they went more towards a popular, well, as, they, as you've seen them progress through the years. Yeah, and you know, that's a whole other story to analyze the success of a band that size. Because one thing about Bon Jovi was they were, they were a working class band from New Jersey, and and they played yeah, every song, right. and they constantly played, and they, they, made, they tried to make themselves better and better. And they, they, they really hit a moment in time where a glam Bruce Springsteen was perfect for the marketplace. And they tapped in because they had, they had songs. And they had a front man who could, whose smile could melt an iceberg and a guitar player who just looked so fucking cool on stage and could play, who had a blues soul. That's a good formula right there. Because John seems like he's motivated more towards the success and the fame. And yes, the John. Money. John Bon Jovi's always about the fame and the fortune. Which absolutely. But he also 
cares about giving his fans a great performance. Because you also write in the book of Pearl Jam that they're getting this huge ride of a huge wave of success, and they want to cut back on that. That's because it happened too quickly. Because they didn't think 10 was going to sell, you know, 10 million records. They, they knew they made a good record, but those guys, they, they came from Seattle. They had never seen a lot of wealth, and that's a kind of a dark community. The music is very existential. The artists were all very close knit up there, and their success, their global success. Well, it, because you have to look at the environment. Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam, and then Nirvana. And there's there's your grunge movement. There it is. And then the, once you have a movement, then everybody comes along for the party. Even though Soundgard really was like Chris was like the godfather of the scene. They didn't have success until big success until the Super Unknown record, which which was perfect for them. And I was I was a really intimate part of that success of that record. It's, their label literally came to me before the record was even done and said, we want you to move. And I said, I'm there. And I wrote about it, and I put Chris on his first cover. And, I mean, I was, a, I was a big sound art, big sound art. And I liked Cornell a lot, because he seemed authentic. He just did. All those guys did. They just, they, the, the whole scene was, it was their scene. I came from here. But I got it. You know, I got it from that first that first trip I made to Seattle. Do you have any thoughts on um, Amy Winehouse and Jamie Lee? I'm, I, Amy Winehouse's situation is is she's a, a completely different situation. Jamie Lee is he lived through a, the decadent eighties into the nineties, survived, had had demons, drank too much, did this was probably had mostly liked by people. And then at 47, his number gets called. And I don't know why, and I can't speculate why. Amy Winehouse is the greatest example of self-fulfilling prophecy in the history of the music business. She rides to multi-platinum fame on a song specifically about how she's not going to get clean. I mean, that... You just knew that that was a train wreck waiting to happen. Now, the fact that she lived it out and that she didn't get the message just proves that her flame was supposed to burn just as long as Janice's and Jim's and Jimmy's and Kurt's. <laughs> she was made for 27. She was supposed to die at 27. I wouldn't be surprised if she unconsciously knew that she wasn't going to live past 27. But I don't feel sad for her death because I I don't feel sad for their deaths because I, I I'm of the mind that when you when when it's not your time nothing can take you when it is your time nothing can save you that you are here for as long as you're supposed to be here you make your mark the karma comes when you haven't accomplished what you need to accomplish I think Amy accomplished what she needed to accomplish Jamie did certainly Jim Morrison did certainly Jimi Hendrix did oh they died too young that's your classic Facebook response with Janie Lane did. Someone said, oh, they died too young. No, they didn't. They died when they were supposed to die. What do you want to be remembered for? I think I'd like to, well, the yogis say we are nothing but the memory we leave behind. So I just want to be remembered as a guy that was, a, you know, that people liked, who lived up to his last name. Thank you, Lord. <laughs>